Welcome. Good afternoon. It's great to see so many people interested in our webinar today. I welcome you all. We are today here for a joint webinar um, that is organized in co coordination between the Regional Studies Association and the Joint Research Center for the European Commission. My name is Heike Meyer, and I'm a professor of economic geography at the University of Bern in Switzerland. So I'm very happy that you could join us online for what promises to be a very interesting and insightful um, discussion today. Today's webinar is the first of three webinars that focuses on the Future of Cities report that the GRC published. The Future of Cities report identifies challenges influencing the future of cities in Europe and beyond. It is an initiative of the GRC, the Science and Knowledge Service of the European Commission, supported by the Commission's Directorate General for Regional and Urban Policy, DG Regio. Um, the work of this report continues now with um, a series of policy briefs and short documents, and one of them focuses on urban rural interactions. And today's presentations will emphasize and um, sort of um, provide us some insights into this topic. And we will hear um, presentations on the interaction dynamics between urban and rural places, territorial disparities, and also on questions related to data and measurement. Urban-rural linkages are becoming a very important topic as we see that um, interdependencies between cities and rural areas are increasing, not at last since we have the COVID-19 pandemic. So before we start, I would like to take care of some housekeeping issues. Um, this Zoom meeting will be recorded and we will make it available on the RSA Europe website. If the camera is not on, if your camera is not on, you will not be recorded. If the camera is on, you will be recorded and be seen on the video that we record. If you have questions, please put them in the chat box and label them with the letter Q so that we see that this is a question. So I'm very happy that we have experts here on this topic, and I would like to first give the word to Louis Dijkstra, who will introduce us to the GRC. Louis Dijkstra works at the European Commission, where he leads the team analyzing cities and territories in the Territorial Development Unit of the Joint Research Center. His work covers topics such as urbanization, accessibility, demography, and the geography of European um, EU discontent and quality of government. I guess, Louis, you're brand new in the job right now, but um, um, I would like you to introduce us GRC and what's behind the GRC. I hand over to you. Thank you, Heike. Yes, this is my third week on the job here. I used to work in the DG for Regional and Urban Policy, where I was the editor of the Cohesion Report. And I worked very closely with the Joint Research Center since they provided a lot of the evidence and the, the analysis that went into the cohesion report. So the Joint Research Center is, uh, is an independent research center. It really aims to provide evidence-based uh, analysis uh, and knowledge of, to support policy development and monitoring of policies and testing the impact of policies. So it's really a, a very large research center. Over 3,000 people work here on a wide variety of topics. And we here in the, the Territorial Development Unit, we focus on especially territorial issues. So issues addressing cities, rural areas, regions, mostly uh, with a European focus, but not exclusively. So. Didn't want to take too much time, uh, uh, but I'm delighted to open it up and pass the floor to Carolina, who will present this first uh, in the series of three policy briefs. Carolina, over yeah. to you. Thank you, Luis. I would like to introduce Carolina formally. Um, Carolina Castillo works at the Territorial and Geospatial Analyst at the European Commission's GRC since 2012. She's particularly focused on the development of the land use modeling platform, LUISA, under EU alternative scenarios. And she is currently involved in the implementation of the EU Rural Observatory and the development of rural related indicators in demography, renewable energies, digitalization, urban rural interactions. 
And she also leads different city activities in the framework of the community of practices on cities of the Knowledge Center for Territorial Policies. She holds a PhD in, in cartography and geodesy engineering from the University of in Valencia. And she's currently finishing a master in big data analytics. So I'm very happy, Carolina, that you take on this task of um, introducing us to the policy brief. And I would like to hand over to you. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Luis. <laughs> thank you, Eik. Also, thank you to all the organizers of this event. Uh, Nikki, Alex, uh, 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 and the uh, heirs uh, uh, in, in general. Also, I would like to thank uh, my two colleagues, Sylvia and Georgia, because they have been behind all this uh, process uh, for this event. So I will think I want to share the presentation of today that as you have anticipated, is um, uh, it's an overview of these interactions between uh, urban and, and rural areas and hopefully uh, it can be interesting for the audience. Of course, thanks to the audience to be here today with, with us. So let's go for it. So as I was mentioning, um, the title of this policy brief was Urban Rural Interactions and the Territorial Disparities. Uh, uh, I will say that this brief um, was published last year, 2022, but it, it started, uh, in fact, uh, some years ago, maybe 2020 or, or something like this. Because uh, as I will uh, explain now, it's a uh, uh, it was participating many people there in different sections, and then uh, yeah, it takes a, a while to integrate everything. Even it's a short uh, document, it takes quite uh, quite a lot of effort to to do it. So today I will uh, go through different topics that, that makes relevance. They have relevance in these urban rural uh, interactions and, and linkages. So this is the list of content, and I will start for who contribute to this work. So basically, it was the unit V3 colleagues, uh, but also the demography and, and migration unit, some colleagues of this uh, unit. Uh, here you can see all of them. But also, I would like to thank the collaboration of some colleagues from EuroCities, the Department of Geography of the University of Valencia, that did a, a small analysis of the transport, the UN Habitat, the Grigio, uh, Research and Innovation as well, uh, the Environment, or some other universities that they review the policy brief uh, at the last stage uh, before the publication. So I really appreciate, we really all appreciate this uh, effort. And also our uh, special thanks for Laura Espiritu, our colleague that is always helping us on the designer side. So say that uh, the policy brief uh, start with a, an introduction of the topics, and here I have just selected uh, the main EU uh, facts and trends. So some of few of them that has relation to the topics that we uh, that I will explain later, and and they have they were analyzed at that moment. So as we know, population demography is always a relevant issue, and there exist these flows uh, between urban rural for different. Uh, um, for different reasons, sometimes just working, sometimes it's uh, for the to, to, to go to, to different uh, environments, uh, natural environments, or so all this. And then uh, we see that population in the from uh, uh, population projections, the, the population is going to, to uh, more or less maintain a slight increase in the in the coming years, but uh, even it's uh, is expected to decline in the long term. This is uh, according to EU. Uh, to the Eurostat projection, but not in, in the same way. There are some cohorts, no? some the classes, age classes that will increase while some other will, will decrease. And then this makes uh, this makes uh, they have this demographic change has an impact in other in other uh, uh, in, in other domains, no? like for instance, uh, access to services. No? So also the housing prices, uh, we will have, uh, we, we, I will present some uh, analysis on it because it's a relevant, uh, a, a relevant uh, uh, topic since uh, people sometimes uh, it's uh, obligated to go uh, to push, they are pushed to move to surrounding areas or rural areas because they, they cannot afford no, the housing in, in main cities. No? And that is 
also the importance of the of the internet connection that uh, there is this digital gap between urban rural areas as well the difference between the type of jobs that we develop in cities and in rural areas and how they are paid in fact and also uh, the conflicts between the urban expansion also agriculture intensive in, in, intensification that has an impact on the environment no in this sense so Saying that as an introductory part, we will just assess some of the topics. So we try to assess some of the topics. And the objective of this the policy brief was the this give an overview of uh, of these uh, interactions uh, with the premise uh, under the premise that they have these mutual interactions across the urban rural continuum. And uh, as I have explained, these flows or linkages can be associated to people, goods and services, or environmental flows. So this is really difficult to measure these flows, especially with some topics. But what we are trying to do is under the lens of the degree of urbanization, try to get some important key messages and, uh, and giving some quantifi quantif quantification analysis no? and providing uh, uh, with the data available, or at least with the data that we have, what we can, uh, what we can assess no? in this sense. So, uh, the first part that is related to, uh, ah, sorry, exactly. So the degree of urbanization for the ones that are not uh, familiar with it is the differentiation between city, towns and suburbs and rural areas. Uh, now we are playing, you know, we are using two different levels, the one at municipality level, which is the one on, on my left hand, the, the one here, and then also the one at NAT3 level or regional level, because the pen of the data and the indicators that we have developed, we need to use one or another to differentiate the urban rural continuum in this case. So uh, the first part is related to demography in this case. So what we did is to take the historical data from 1961 to uh, 2011, that was uh, the, the, the data set. Then we include 2018 from our team, uh, population and also our projections uh, to, to up to 2050 uh, from the Luisa territorial modeling plan as you as mentioned before. So what we saw is that uh, while uh, a city's population in the red line, no, this is the European uh, graph, uh, 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 continue increasing till up to 2050. Also towns and suburbs, that is the orange line, rural areas still quite stable and even decreasing a bit, which is, was this 1.2% per, decreasing between uh, the, the bit, from 2001 in this case. So this is a European uh, uh, scene, but uh, this is different between countries. Now I put here the example of Bulgaria, where uh, we can see immediately the decrease on rural areas, but also for instance, Italy, we have more stable the three typologies. So here in this map, what we can see is the dark colors represent the increase in population, uh, either city, population in city and town source on rural areas, while the lighter uh, colors represent the decrease on this population. So I have to do some zooming uh, in three countries, uh, in several countries, no, three, several countries, for instance, the Iberian Peninsula with uh, Spain and Portugal, where we can see the dark uh, areas, which means population concentrated in mainly in capitals and uh, coastal areas, where the inner rural part has been during all these decades decreasing. And then also uh, it's uh, uh, Germany has a special case as well where population from the eastern part moved to the west side. And also we can see the ring of Berlin there immediately. And uh, we have the third, uh, the third example on the, in the Benelux area. So the Netherlands, Belgium and Luxembourg where mostly uh, uh, the, most of the areas are increasing. In, uh, this, despite being uh, cities, uh, uh, towns and suburbs or rural. So the three typologies have been increasing during these decades. So what we did also is assess uh, the, this, uh, this long period, but by decades. So in this case, uh, we have the first column cities, towns and suburbs in the middle and rural areas. And here, what we see is that we can split, uh, we can define three, three population uh, profiles. No? The, the first one involves these countries, Bulgaria, Lithuania, uh, Croatia, Latvia, and so on. Because in this case, rural areas are decreasing, but 
as a reflect of the uh, white uh, countrywide negative trend. So it's it's all the country is decreasing or has been decreasing during the decades. Uh, even each decade is represented in different colors and sometimes uh, uh, they for instance for rural areas all the decades decrease while for some others uh, the other stakeholders sometimes the decades increase or decrease this is co uh, computed by the annual growth rate per each decade so the second group of countries are the ones that rural the population is declining but uh, the countrywide population is growing so we have this uh, in this case we have spain greece italy sweden uh, Slovakia and so on. And the third group is the group that the three typologies are increasing and uh, also almost in for all decades. So these are uh, these are uh, been increasing uh, during this long period. So at the end of the day, towns and suburbs uh, have been the ones that have growing uh, at a higher rate uh, compared to, for instance, rural areas. So going to uh, another topic, no, sorry. The last, the last one is how uh, the the net migration plays a role in uh, in trying to make a balance in, in the, trying to make a balance in this demography uh, uh, situation. No, here this was done by the demography and, and uh, the migration and demography unit, and is is the is a graph that represent the net migration by uh, by age classes. No, in this case we have. And a split between 20, 30, and 60 here, according to different territorial typologies and characteristics. So, just some examples of this uh, that we can take from this graph is that the young, young people, for instance, between 20 and 24 years, they tend to move uh, to cities and uh, within cities, no? probably due to more educational, uh, uh, educational uh, opportunities. Young adults between 25 and 29 report this negative net migration in less developed, uh, less developed places and the, the populated areas, while uh, these, the ones in the course between 30 and 34 tend to prefer suburban and rural areas maybe link it for the family formation in this case no and the elderly uh, move in counter uh, counter tendency towards rural areas compared to jumps so this is just some example that they got, but there are more in the brief and you can invite you to go further uh, to go to read more on it so all this demographic situation has uh, an impact on the provision of services uh, and this is why we include here so uh, the the um, a brief analysis uh, this uh, this provision of services by these indicators, which is an average road distance to the closer uh, uh, service of general interest. No, so uh, here we include uh, the retailer, primary schools, pharmacies, banks, secondary schools, hospital, and cinema. And this graph represents the average uh, distance uh, by degree of urbanization. So with the uh, uh, to see, and we can see here that, for instance, the rural areas uh, in remote places are the ones that uh, has more difficult access to this type of services. No, in this case, so here is the summary of this. No, specifically, for instance, for school and hospitals, very essential services. People living in rural areas has to travel between two and five times more than people living in, in a city. And then here the map, we are showing only uh, an example of the distances at municipality level uh, for the case of the health service, uh, health service points, no? the distance uh, to uh, the nearest health service uh, point. So uh, as I mentioned before, also the, 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 the continuing increasing on the house prices put this pressure on people that has lower uh, income, or mid lower and middle uh, uh, middle uh, uh, incomes, no household incomes, but also the younger generation. This means that there is a, there is in fact a case study in the, in the Netherlands. You can find it in the brief to see that the four main cities have losing population in favor of the suburb so peripheral uh, places because of the increase of the of the housing so we have this uh, also uh, movement of people because of yeah of of of, of the unaffordable prices of the houses in the cities no and here the graph shows uh, these uh, transitional prices uh, per meter square and we can see that the rural areas represented in green for different uh, for most of the counties are the one with the lower uh, prices 
while on the contrary, uh, uh, urban areas are the ones that uh, are the places where the prices are, are higher. Um, what else? Uh, yes, important, very important currently for, for everybody is the, the internet connections in this case. We saw that the uh, urban rural digital divide, as I mentioned before, is uh, something that even with the uh, with the um, recent uh, improvement in the development of the digital and and, and the and the deployment of uh, high speed access, no, uh, still still uh, this uh, this differentiation between urban and, and rural areas, no. But slowly, slowly, the rural areas are catching, catching up and hopefully uh, they enjoy in the near future better internet connection. Here, we want it only to reflect, in this case, was the percentage of the household that has access to very high capacity networks in this case. Uh, and then we show at the moment that less than 40% of the EU households in rural areas uh, only have access to a very high uh, speed networks. So compared to the 62 percent in urban households so there is this differentiation and also uh, some countries as um, um and as um sorry i lost here the yeah no exactly so but in case in, in, in fact for instance some countries as denmark or netherlands even in remote rural areas they have a very good access so it depends specifically of the country we can see here also by degree of urbanization which country has higher uh, higher access to to this uh, speed high speed uh, broadband so it's all all as well now with uh, compared to the other to the other uh, uh, other topics again uh, it's depending of countries because some countries invest more in some in some uh, in this case not for instance in, in digitalization than others so this is reflected uh, at the end in the in the analysis so related to tourism also i fear here i will highlight the uh, the the situationality uh, uh, that that creates this also these flows on population in the sense of uh, we, we have seen of course in summertime when some places especially coastal areas but also small towns and and in summertime we have uh, this uh, sometimes even double triple or, or more population than uh, than in in in, in a normal period of the year no? so um, also in winter time for some uh, areas that are uh, related to uh, ski activities, we have seen this, uh, this uh, increase of population, uh, particularly in some specific periods of the year. So seasonality, it's a really uh, important factor to take into account on this. And, uh, and in general terms, uh, we can see that the coastal regions, including Iceland, the, the, they are characterized by having the high, highest shares of night spent by tourists, or in, in general terms, in absolute terms. But when we look at the per capita, the situation changed because, of course, rural areas has low density population, so this is reflected also in the analysis. So we need to take into account with, that, with type of indicators we, we use for assess these type of things, no? And, uh, and then, as I mentioned uh, here, we reflect the, the situationality and, uh, and, and it's important also, also related to the access to services because if the population is moving to an area and they have double or more population, then the access, the, the services needs to be adapted to, to this uh, different uh, situation. Carolina, oh, yes. you're finally five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm finishing. Uh, so the, the last uh, flow is related to environment, as we mentioned. So the Luisa, the Luisa Territorial Modeling Platform provide us uh, projection, land use projection. And this is uh, something that we can use to assess this uh, land use flow. So how the land, uh, the land uses are going to be converted in the future. And, and also what are the impacts of these conversions, no? So for instance, uh, if, we, if we read this graph, this means that the urban was increasing uh, between the period 2012, 2013 in this case, uh, at expenses of uh, arable land, forest, and permanent crops, and uh, bioenergy. So we can assess uh, uh, which land is increasing, but at expenses of which other, no? The one that we are losing in this case. So this means that, for instance, build up areas as we are seeing, uh, they are taking agriculture land, for instance, 
Uh, and usually agriculture and forest try to balance each other you know, because when we lose some, one, some of these land uses, the other one probably is increasing because of afforestation. But in general, then Europe is going to lose uh, agriculture land, land uh, uh, is expected to decrease agriculture land, sorry, by 1.6% uh, uh, by 2030. An important also a land use change is agriculture land abandonment, but because it's not only that we lose agriculture because it's taken by other land uses, it's also because they become abandoned. And, and by 2030, we assess that uh, we quantify this uh, abandon on agriculture land uh, and it's estimated to reach uh, 3.5 of the all uh, European utilized agriculture area. Uh, finally, also important um, related uh, to all the topics that we have mentioned is these territorial and urban development strategies. Why? Because these strategies, uh, they cover, they try to help uh, uh, in, the, in this unbalanced situation, no? by the funds, by, of course, this the implementation under the EU cohesion policy. And uh, with this uh, assessment that we did at that moment, we only want to highlight that, uh, for instance, the functional urban areas that maybe most of you are uh, familiar with it, they don't only cover the urban needs, no? They cover all this uh, uh, integration of the areas that are uh, uh, within this functional urban area, is this sense? And for instance, uh, uh, we can see how many municipalities classified as uh, urban and remote areas are also benefiting from this uh, integration, integrated funds, no? Within the functional urban areas is just, uh, an example of it. And also the, this build, all this uh, uh, sustainable urban development and build on, on the place-based uh, approach to really uh, tackle uh, uh, responses, the, the, the needs of the area, uh, with, for instance, challenges that can be related to social inclusion, environment protection and transport. And I'm going to final finish this with, uh, okay, just to mention that in the policy brief, we can find also uh, some examples, case studies, projects that are related to the topics that I have been explaining here. I will not enter into many detail of it. And finally, how is the way that we can continue uh, uh, helping, not contributing to this, uh, to strengthen these urban rural linkages? No? For instance, the uh, communication on the long term mission for rural areas already mentioned that they identify challenges and opportunities in rural areas depend on these uh, interdependencies with cities. No? So they are really need to work together to be a, a strong, no? uh, more mm -hmm. further strong. Also some, as I have mentioned, EU policies and place-based uh, strategies are really important for the integration and the sustainable uh, territorial and local development. The Green Deal, we know already that this is important in different ways because rural have different uh, opportunities and challenges and roles than cities because they can uh, also contribute to the management of natural resources, mitigation effects of climate change, improving energy efficiency, while cities need to work in an different path, let's say more green infrastructures, energy efficiency in buildings, or, or more uh, sustainable uh, transport and different mo mobility modes. And finally, also, uh, this is all our task, in fact, to uh, develop new tools, new methods, uh, also access to more data to try to uh, explore and quantify no, in, a, in a better way, if it's possible, uh, the, strength, uh, the strength of the linkages across the urban rural continuum. So with this, I finish. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, hopefully I can have, uh, <laughs> I can have uh, with this time at least to give an overview of the of this study and policy. Yeah. Thank you very much, Carolina, for this very interesting presentation and this overview of urban rural issues, but also you touched on the linkages and interactions. I would like to introduce the second speaker. Um, it is Dani Aribar Bell. Um, he is interested in computers, cities, and data. And he's a professor in geographic data science at the Department of Geography and Planning of the University of Liverpool, where he's also a member of the Geographic Data Science Lab. 
He is the Deputy Program Director for Urban Anal Analytics at the Alan Turing Institute, where he's also a member, oh, sorry, where he's also an ECRC -E Fellow. So Dani, thank you very much. Um, you can share your slides. In the meantime, I can everybody let, uh, let everybody know that you can put a question in the chat. Please label it with a Q. And I hand over to you, Dani. Okay, thanks very much, Heike. Uh, can I just check my slides are visible? I am yes. visible and hearable. Yes, I see also the web, the internet bar, the address bar, which Yes, I'm not sure I, if you would uh, like to have that, but we might we might have to live with that. Okay, with that that's use. fine. Then um, I see the slide. Yeah. In the interest of uh, open standards, I might leave the, the browser on. But um, thank you very much, and I'm going to try to take uh, 15 minutes and resist my um, academic impetus to to continue talking, which I can definitely do uh, and stick to to that. And in, in some ways, some of what I'm going to talk about very much picks up at the uh, at Carolina's last uh, points about developing new data tools and, and methods for for messing rural for messing urban rural interactions, but really for messing urban rural better. And I, I think um, ultimately policy cares about the interactions and about what happens in these places, but how policy sees these places, really how uh, by how these data sets and, and the tools that we use define these places. So a lot of what I'm going to, to be talking about is, is a bit more fundamental, but hopefully connects into uh, some of the discussions that have been put forward before. And just to, to acknowledge that a lot of the work that I'm going to be presenting as an illustration is in collaboration with Martin Fleischmann, who is the data scientist in the in the current project. So this idea of the urban rural continuum, in, in some ways I, I've called it continuum because it really is one. Um, it, you know, in some ways, measuring what is urban and what is rural, um, as I say here, is, is in the eyes of the beholder. And I mean, I mean this in two ways. One in, in, in one in that it is a really nuanced definition and, and the boundary is not always clear. On the other, the other meaning that I use here is that actually depending on what you are trying to do, the boundary will be in, in one in one place or in another. And what in some cases we uh, is is preferable to consider urban. In other cases, it might be preferable to call peri-urban, or it might be preferable to even call rural. So, this idea of of what is urban, what is rural, on the one hand, is is variable, is is not clear cut, but at the same time, it's really important to get it right. And it's very important to get it right. I'm going to pull off here my geography hat uh, and hope that some of the audience will have this geography hat too, uh, because I didn't I didn't put the whole term. It's, it's too long. MAUP stands for the modifiable aerial unit problem. Is this property of uh, geographical scales that that says or that states that uh, if you measure things at the wrong scale, you're you are you may be getting things wrong. You, your results may be biased, not or you may be. Uh, which in, in this context, I think is probably even more important, you may be not picking up things that are actually there. So in, in, in when you're looking at the urban rural continuum, I think calling urban something when it really should be rural, what it does is it blurs the, the boundary between the two, but it blurs it in an artificial way. If, if it's reality that is blurred, that is really interesting. If it's the data that is blurred, you're basically going to be ignoring things that are there and you will not be picking them up. And in, in you know, if you flip this around, effectively having more granularity in how we measure the urban rural continuum is not just better, it is better insight, but it's not just better insight, it's also more insights because there are things that we are probably missing now not because they're not important, but because we're measuring things in, in incorrect ways. Or uh, incorrect is a heavy word, but in we could be measuring them better. Let's let's leave it at, at that. Uh, and really now, of course, the, there's a lot of trade trade-off here. I, I, I pulled up my geography hat before. I'm going to pull up my economies hat now and remember everyone that there's no free lunch. And there's always uh, at least one, if not more than one, trade-off at, at stake here. And, and when you're looking at measuring and quantifying uh, the urban rural continuum you're really in between these three you're in 
you're at tension with three three trends that you would like to be hitting at the same time. You want detailed information. You want detailed characterizations that allow you to draw the urban, rural, and in between spaces in as much granularity as possible. But you want to be able to scale that because if you can only measure that for a, a small region, for a small town, or even for a country, then you're you're missing the not the whole point, but you're missing comparisons across large areas. And in some cases, I don't have to convince probably anyone in this in this uh, audience that that that's important. So you want to be a scalable, and you also want to be able to scale while retaining consistency, which is to say, is not the same to scale the, measuring the detail urban rural. In, in five countries in five different ways, what you really want to do is have as ideally one way of, of measuring it that scales across the country so you can make those comparisons and be relatively certain of what you're of what you're doing. Okay, so this is the first half of my talk on, on a little bit of the, the ideas and what I wanted to put for. And now I'm going to uh, I'm going to if I don't Get sick. Yes, talk about uh, an illustration with the project that we've been running out of the Alan Turing Institute, the National Institute for Data Science and AI um, in the UK. The project uh, is called the Urban Grammar and it has different phases. The one I'm going to talk about today is, is the first one, which is finished already. Um, and you, you're more than welcome to check out the, the website of the of the project for a bit more details and I'll also a couple of links more in, in a second. And before I, I follow, I, I added this disclaimer at the when I completed the slides, because and I truly mean this. Um what I'm about to say is by no means a criticism of the the existing classification we have today, and in particular the one that the the brief that Carolina presented uses the degree of urbanization. In some ways, it's actually I think an endorsement of the principles and the mentality that that actually made people create the degree of urbanization. I think the the degree of urbanization comes, or at least the way I see, it, and I might be wrong here, so please jump jump on me if I'm not. But come from the from this very idea that you can really just that urban rural is not a binary, it's really a continuum. And, and at some point we have to start putting more, more detail. So what I'm going to say now is that that we should continue down that path and create more detailed classifications that 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 we can use for, for doing more cool stuff. So that aside, what we've developed with the Urban Grammar project, the, the signature, the flagship uh, data product that we've released now is what we call the spatial signatures. It's a classification of form and function. And, and this is, we keep it very abstract because the, that's the whole point. We're, we're not saying that it's a classification of urban and rural. We're, we're classifying form and function. We're focusing on urban environments, but with, with a very general and comprehensive uh, outlook. And what, what we've arrived at is these 16 classes that cover everything from what we call wild countryside, which is what you can think of um, the Scottish Highlands. And then on the other end of the continuum, and this really, I mean, it's not a continuum, it's 16 classes, but on the other end of these 16 classes, what you have is a couple of classes that actually only happen in London. One of them is Soho, and the other one is a ring around Soho, which is the, the what our classification finds the most urban uh, part of, of Great Britain. So if you're interested in the classes, you can uh, read a bit more on, on that website, urbangrammarai.xyz forward slash story, which is an, an, an infographic on the classes and how we build them. There's, there's a lot, I'm going very quickly, but this is like two years of by far the most brilliant person I've worked with in, in a very long time, Martin Fleischmann, working full time on these. So that there's a lot behind the scenes uh, that needed to happen that I'm going to skip today. What I will show you is just to give you a sense and, and, and connect some of the dots on, on what we've done here with the ideas that I was discussing a minute ago. This is the uh, the map of this our spatial signatures, the 16 classes that I showed you above for the what we call the Scottish uh, urban belt that spans from Glasgow to Edinburgh. You can see first it covers all of the geography and then there's 16 class well there's actually 14 because there's two that i told i just told you only happen in in london but you're seeing here 14 classes what you see is hopefully a lot of granularity and if you uh if you spend a bit more time looking at the 16 classes there's about three that we call that are non-urban we we sort of take a, a a land use classification approach and then we invert it. A lot of land use classifications spend a lot of effort on classifying the part that is non-cities, and they'll tell you everything about the, the 
type of shrub and bushes that you can find. And then when it gets to a city, they will say, this is a city and that's it. What we do is a little bit the other way around. We, we call what's nature wild nature, and, and we don't tell you anything else because there are classifications for that already. But when you get into parts that are a bit more urban, we start adding granularity and, and detail. So you can see that right away, most of the land is actually non-cities. That We know this already, and this gets picked up in these three classes. Then we have, here I'm highlighting just three, uh, but this is where it starts getting interesting. This is what we call peri-urban um, regions, and it, it picks them up, and then you can go into the, the urban ones. But the point I wanted to make here today is that this is the, the, the split that I've just happened to do to show, to, to prove the point. But depending on the project that you were working on, what you were interested in, you could make that split very much on, on your own way. And you could go a bit more urban or a bit less urban and then use that as a bespoke delineation for whatever product you're, or project you're trying to, to work on. So I have two minutes left. And on those, what I'm going to show you is a little bit what I've called here, uh, what we're the, the world we're starting to walk into, uh, that five years ago, it was definitely science fiction. And today is a little bit a little bit less fiction, hopefully. And it really comes into this combination of, of satellite and remote sensing technology, computational power, and a little bit of AI stardust or, or machine learning algorithms. And um, the motivation for, for looking into this is that this classification that I've shown you here, I think is probably as, as detailed as we can get today. And it I don't think you can get much more detail than this with satellite only. The problem is what I said, it took two years of a really brilliant postdoc and a bit of my time and a lot of data sources that don't get updated very regularly. On the other hand, satellite imagery does get updated very regularly. Uh, some of it get up, gets updated when there's cloud, so you have to discard it. And I know that very well in, in, in the UK. Um, but there's a lot of technology that's coming on board that, that can ignore clouds and that you can get, that allows you to get data much more frequently than you would if you had to rebuild this classification every single time that you want an update. So what we are working on now, and this is very much, you know, is, is research, is, is science, is not, production ready and is maybe not policy ready just yet, but I think it will be pretty soon. And, and this is not commentary of my work, it's commentary of where the world and technology is, is going. So we start with this map of the classes that I showed you before. This is not built on satellite, but then what we're trying to do is predict this map or create a prediction of this map based on, on satellite imagery. And what we're doing is we're trying to, we're, we're using um, state-of-the-art computer vision, deep learning algorithms, to try to predict each of the 16 classes that I showed you before. So here you get, for example, a map of predictions of wild countryside, which is very much picking up the, um, the Peak District and, and the Lake District and so on. Here is another example with urbanity. And we do that, we do this, we create these prediction maps or these probability maps for every class. And then we put them up together and we arrive at maps like this. This, of course, does not look exactly like this one, but it only takes imagery and you can basically recreate it every six months or every time you have a, a cloud-free mosaic. And in our case, we're using optical. And I think where we're moving is towards a world where we can build these fine-grained detailed classifications every few years. And in between, we can rebuild them and we can get something better from satellite. But what we can get is updates that tell us a little bit about trends. It's almost like... Um, now casting where, where the world is until we can get a, a rebuild of a, of a detailed classification that we can trust again. It's a little bit like doing things in between censuses. You, you can run a census every year, but you can get trends and, 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 and updates. And with that, I'm going to stop uh, for now. And if there's any questions, I'm, I'm really happy to take them up later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dani, for this very fascinating insight into your um, project of mapping, but also engaging with new methodologies and data sources. So I think um, that's really a, a sort of frontier that we have to go. Um, perhaps I would, would like to start out by asking both of you, um, uh, what kind of challenges have you encountered or do you think we are encountering in terms of sort of grasping urban rural linkages interactions and flows because both of your presentations were sort of looking at urban versus rural um, but not so much on the interactions the linkages and one of the participants sort of highlighted that and 
I would like to have both of you respond to this issue, how you grappled with it, maybe in the report, Carolina, and Dani, how do you think could you grapple with it in the future when you engage with the new methods and technologies? Yes, it's, in fact, uh, this is what I say in the, I think the, the second slide, you know, that it's very difficult to quantify these uh, flows, no, or these uh, interactions. So, uh, for instance, for, for maybe for the demography population, it can be even it's difficult, but it can or transport where you have you can do this. Imagine uh, a origin destination uh, things or or maybe net. Imagine for the migration or no? where people from which, which place they move to the the final destination. No? So you need to have uh, access uh, to this type of of, of data, uh, and for some indicators, it's very difficult. So we are trying to. For instance, with our platform, no, with with the Luisa for the environmental side, no, we can. I have some so just one example of land uses, no, but you can uh, extend it to to other to other type of uh, environmental issues, no, as as maybe uh, uh, soil sequest uh, carbon sequestration or or some some soil erosion. There is projection, so you can see this these flows or this uh, changing, but uh, you need to, I think at the end, we need to use other tools or other things when the data is not available or this type of flows are not available. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to be closer uh, as much as possible to, mm -hmm. to this, but uh, yeah. And, and then my end, my last presentation, my last slide was this, no, we need new tools, yeah. we need new data. Uh, Daniel has shown the, the part of the remote sensing, no, with machine learning, with this thing. So I think we need to move to this environment more and more, no? All one some topics uh, we have covered there because we we are progressing and continue working on different topics uh, as for instance energy social issues uh, some other uh, things of you know, building efficiencies or, 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 or. so uh, yes it was just only a few examples of mm -hmm. the topics that in house we are working on uh, mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Nani yeah I, I mean I want that much more to what Carolina said. I think that the bottom line is that it is tremendously difficult and tricky, uh, but at the same time, it's important. So we have to, to come up with, with ways. I think um, the one point I'll probably add a bit more is I think there is a tremendous opportunity in quantifying interactions between regions at, at granular, spatial, and temporal scales with new forms of data. I've shown you some an example with remote sensing, which is it's tricky to possibly to use for interactions, because interactions are, are, you know, by their very nature, they're invisible. They, there are things that happen, but they, they don't get recorded in a, in a photograph. But mm -hmm. but I think you could draw parallels with alternative um, data sets that record transport, that record uh, cultural interactions, et cetera. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for not only exploring new forms of data, but also sort of all that are becoming available, things like trace statistics that are a bit more creative than than traditional ones or than traditional surveys. And, and what I will say is that the problem with a lot of these new data sources is that they're actually very ephemeral. Uh, you know, for all the research that was made on Twitter, I'm, I'm glad I didn't do a lot of that because I would be probably scrambling to find a new career now that Twitter is becoming a very different entity. And, mm -hmm. and I think what we need is sort of the, Institutions of trust. So, you, yes. if you want things like the the um, offices of of statistics, census bureaus, and probably at, at supranational level, things like the European Commission, working closely with the data providers to make sure that you know, if Twitter goes out of business, there is still something that is comparable. That there are ways that are transparent for continuing using these these mm -hmm. data sources. That's a very important point. Luis, do you want to add, because you mentioned in the chat that you're working on something related to the functional urban areas? Yeah, so um, one of the things that we're trying to do here at the JRC together with Agri and Rijo is develop something we call functional rural areas. Um, they are basically the rural equivalent of our functional urban areas. They're not necessarily based on commuting because commuting in rural areas is multi-directional. It's not focused on necessarily one particular center, 
uh, but it's more built around the idea of creating an area which captures most of the daily trips. So trips not just to work, but also to school, to shops, uh, and to, to socialize for sports. And there, it, of course, it challenges us to see if we can actually test that hypothesis. Um, the, the functional rural areas are built around settlements, so they're built around villages and towns. We combine the really small ones to make sure that they have a bit of minimum population size and we don't have too many of them. But this is more of a, you know, a, um, a very simple approach um, built on top of the degree of urbanization that I can explain, but I want to find additional data to demonstrate that this does in fact actually capture most of daily trips. So then we're scrambling, okay, where are people buying their groceries? You know, so yeah. we're looking at payment data. If can we link it to the house they people live in? Um, can we get can, you know movements uh, through mobile phones or through apps um, to see what the trips look like? Because mm -hmm. indeed, as Danny you know emphasized, it's very difficult to capture movement or, or interactions. Uh, you don't they don't show up on a satellite image. So, but that's what we're working on and uh, sharing that. And um, mm -hmm. wanted to just also. Uh, emphasize with Danny that I fully agree that you need the right concepts um, for for the type of analysis that you are doing. And depending on what you want, you might want to use a, a different definition or a different continuum or a different approach. I think that's a very nice uh, yeah. approach. May I ask a question? Yes, I still have some questions from the chat. If if you don't mind, I post them first, and you keep yours in mind. Um, Two questions uh, specifically to Carolina. Um, one was the question about the typology um, by Camille um, Begon. Uh, which typology of urban versus rural territories do you use in your study? Is it the functional urban areas definition of the OECD? And then I have one other question. I will maybe no, no, clarify no, no. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. We use the degree of urbanization in this case, uh, which is, is uh, publicly available, and you can download it from uh, uh, use at Disco. No, right? Uh, yes. And then also it was published last year. Last year. For some analysis, we include um, uh, the rural. Uh, sorry, the remote dimension as well because we are working also in, in as, as we were mentioning, not trying to make uh, as much as possible this uh, continuum more detailed, no? And then we include the rural, the remote dimension as well. Um, and then uh, the urban rural typology that is called it when we talk about Nat Street, that is uh, mm -hmm. also public available uh, from Eurostat as well. Mm -hmm. So they have the same classes, more or less, the same methodology behind more or less, different terminology, uh, but uh, they are publicly available. Mm -hmm. And one more question for you was um, from Sarah. She asked um, about omission of data. And actually, being from Switzerland, I'm used to that. We are always the white sort of island in Europe <laughs> when it comes to data. But she asked um, the question, for example, on the slide on housing prices. Um, she thinks that uh, countries like Greece were not included? Um, is this a question of methodology, data availability, or why was this the case? Yeah, exactly. Only 20 count for 20 countries we had uh, data available. So yes, probably the missing ones are because, yeah, they were not uh, data for, for the analysis. Yes, okay. yes. Thank you. Luis, you had a question. Yeah, I had a question for Danny. I, I really like the maps you were showing, and they, they, they struck me as quite intuitive. But what I always struggle with when I'm trying to communicate the definition to you know, a broader audience or a politician or a policymaker is that you need to be able to explain in relatively simple terms what you did or you know, what concept you're trying to capture. Now, if you had to pick one of those 14 classes and actually tell us what it is rather than where, how would you do that? Um, so I'm going to pull on my academic hat instead of one sentence, use two uh, here. Uh, I'll say so the classification is built on form and function. So by form, what I mean is the shape of the built environment. Uh, and this is almost entirely built on 
characteristics of the street network, the building footprints, and then the relationships between the two things, like how detached from the street the buildings are, how big the plots around in every building is, etc. And then function is uh, a lot of information about more traditional land uses, availability of amenities, types of employment industries that those employments are in their uh, residential, etc. So what we do is we built uh, our own spatial unit because I do take the MAUP seriously. So one that is is designed or we think is is optimized for looking at at form and function, and then for each of those we attach all of this form and function information, which is a lot of data sets that come from many different sources. And in the end, we have about 300 variables. And then what we do is we we group, we cluster those. Um, and that gives rise to the to the classes. So we start with 14 million tiny, well, in most cases, tiny polygons, and then we end up with bigger aggregations because function, form and function is, is smooth over space. So to give you a sense, the, the Soho one is it only happens in Soho because it's a, a unique combination of one type of morphology, highly compact, uh, tall buildings, very, very, very dense, very small space between the building and streets and so on. And also is a unique combination of functions. So there's not a lot of residential, there's only employment, there's one particular case of employment, finance, creative industries, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, there's limited green space access, uh, but there's a, there's a concentration of amenities that you cannot find anywhere else. So if in terms of, I, I sort of use the where as a proxy for what, because, but, but maybe it's not a, an obvious one, because yes, it, I mean, Soho is Soho because of what it looks like, but also because of everything you can access there, which as it turns out is, is unique in, in more ways than, than you can think. And then I'll just use the final, final one, because it's a question that I've had sometimes. If you put form and function, which one really decides? And the what we've found is that the interesting thing is that it depends where you are on the continuum. So if you're on the on the nature part, what you really need is just a little bit of form, basically to know are there any buildings there. And if there aren't any buildings, that's pretty much one nature. Not only that, but it's mostly. But as you get into more urban parts, it really is the function that the place performs that decides what, what classification that ends. And I think that's particularly relevant in this discussion because where you draw the, the urban rural boundaries sometimes is much more, as you were saying, is functional. And what you really care about uh, for policy is is functional. So in that case, you, you really need to get into the functional, which is important, but it's also the more tricky to obtain data, so mm -hmm. there's no free lunch. <laughs> okay, we are at the end of the, our time. I'm fully aware that we still have questions in the chat. Um, perhaps you can post these questions individually to Carolina, Dani, or Luis um, in an email. They are quite happy to respond to your email, but we have to finish this webinar. I would like to thank Carolina, Dani for your presentations, also Luis for introducing us to the GRC. And a particularly big thank you to RSA staff, to Alex and Nikki, who are behind the scenes and uh, organize these webinars. And please also check the next um, two webinars. Uh, the next one will be on May 25th. Um, it will be on cities fit for the digital age. Um, and then on May 31st um, is a webinar, a joint webinar, RSA, GRC, again, on shrinking cities. So with that, I would like to wish you all a very nice afternoon. And thank you very much for participating. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everyone.